But any other witness? My Lord, before I call the next witness, may I first present to you the petition of the petitioners, and may that document be marked Exhibit P1. Jacqueline, and uh, both of you. And next, may I uh, submit to your Lordship's uh, attention the statutory declaration of Ali Abbas, Elias Ali Shalal, as Exhibit P2. Jacqueline, please. Thirdly, I would like to submit the statutory declaration of Mr. Abbas Abid as Exhibit P3. And may I, my Lord, uh, submit to you the statutory declaration of Faiza Alaraji as P4. May I submit to you the statutory declaration of Bassam Akram Marubi as P5. The statutory declaration of Dr. Walid Salah as P6. And finally, the statutory declaration of Nachwa Jama Jalamna as P6. Can I repeat, my Lord, the petition is marked as P1, exhibit P1, the petition to the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission. You have that, my Lords? P2 will be the, the declaration of Ali Shalal. P3, Abbas Abib. P4, Faiza Alaraji. P5, Basam Akram Marubi. Uh, P6 is Dr. Walid Salah. And P7, Nachwa Jalamna. My Lord, I will be uh, calling uh, the following witnesses. First, Mr. Dirk Andrinson, followed by uh, Dr. Walid, then Nachwa, and then Mr. Ibrahim Al Musawi. May I now call upon Mr. Dirk Andrinson to, to the stand, please? Honourable Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, I have the honour to present to you the findings of the World Tribunal on Iraq which was a people's court started in 2003 and had its culminating final session in Istanbul on 23rd to 27th of June 2005. 
why a people's court I can explain this with one document that I also would like to present to the Commission. This is an answer of Mr. Moreno Ocampo of the International Criminal Court and I would like to read a few sentences to show you that this institution is created for victors' justice and that the victims have nowhere to go in the inter international uh, forum or arena or, or court or whatever. This has been written on 9 February 2006. This is practically three years after the complaints that have been filed. Three years it took the special uh, prosecutor of the ICC to give an answer. Okay. It starts with, thank you for your communication concerning the situation in Iraq. The office of the prosecutor has received over 240 communications concerning the situation in Iraq. These communications express the concerns of numerous citizens and organizations regarding the launching of military operations and the resulting human loss. Okay, 240 complaints, formal complaints, have been made before the International Criminal Court. He answers in 10 pages, and I would like to go to page 8 to read just a, a few sentences. He says, while in a general sense any crime within the jurisdiction of the court is grave, the statute requires an additional threshold of gravity even where the subject matter jurisdiction is satisfied. This assessment is necessary as the court is faced with multiple situations involving hundreds of thousands of crimes and must select a situation in accordance with the Article 53 criteria. For war crimes, a specific gravity threshold is set down in Article 8.1, which states that the court shall have jurisdiction in respect of war crimes, in particular when committed as part of a plan or policy or as part of a large-scale commission of such crimes. This threshold is not an element of the crime, and the words in particular suggest that this is not a strict requirement. And he says, according to the available information, it did not appear that any of the criteria of Article 8.1 were satisfied, meaning that the war crimes committed in Iraq are not grave enough to open up a case after 240 complaints. Now, I should not be angry before a commission, before a formal commission, but uh, excuse me uh, for the emotions I am. So, I would like to present this as Exhibit 1. Eight, Exhibit 8, I'm sorry. <laughs> I uh, lost track of the count. There's another um, piece of evidence that I would like to present which is the declaration of the jury of conscience of the World Tribunal on Iraq, which I will uh, read to you now. So in the light of the blatantly un unwillingness of, of the International Criminal, Criminal Court to examine anything, um, we decided to set up a people's court. 
So in February 2003, weeks before an illegal war was initiated against Iraq, millions of people protested in the streets of the world. That call went unheeded. No international institution had the courage or conscience to stand up to the threat of aggression of the US and the UK governments. No one could stop them. It is now four years later. Iraq has been invaded, occupied, and devastated. The attack on Iraq is an attack on justice, on liberty, on our safety, on our future, on us all. We, the people of conscience, decided to stand up. We formed the World Tribunal on Iraq to demand justice and a peaceful future. The legitimacy of the World Tribunal on Iraq was located in the collective conscience of humanity. And the Istanbul session was the culmination of a series of 20 hearings held in different cities of the world focusing on the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq. These sessions were held in Barcelona, Brussels, Copenhagen, Genoa, Hiroshima, Istanbul, Lisbon, London, Mumbai, New York, Östersund, Paris, Rome, Seoul, Stockholm, Tunis, various cities in Japan and Germany, and, uh, and, and the conclusions of all these sessions were appended to this decla declaration, but in a separate uh, volume. I will give you an overview of the findings. One, the invasion and occupation of Iraq was and is illegal. The reasons given by the US and UK governments for the invasion and occupation of Iraq in March 2003 have proven to be false. Much evidence supports the conclusion that a major motive for the war was to control and dominate the Middle East and its vast reserves of oil as a part of the U.S. drive for global hegemony. Two, blatant falsehoods about the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and the link between Al-Qaeda terrorism and Saddam Hussein government were manufactured in order to create public support for a preemptive assault upon a sovereign independent nation. Three, Iraq has been under siege for years. The imposition of severe inhuman, inhumane economic sanctions on 6th of August 1990, the establishment of no-fly zones in the northern and southern parts of Iraq, and the concomitant bombing of the country were all aimed at degrading and weakening Iraq's human and material resources and capacities in order to facilitate its subsequent invasion and occupation. In this enterprise, the US and British leaderships had the benefit of a complicit UN Security Council. Four, in pursuit of their agenda of empire, the Bush and Blair governments blatantly ignored the massive opposition to the war expressed by millions of people around the world they embarked upon one of the most unjust, immoral, and cowardly wars in history. Five, established international political legal mechanisms have failed to prevent this attack and to hold the perpetrators accountable. The impunity that the U.S. government and its allies enjoy has created a serious international crisis that questions the import and significance of international law, of human rights covenants, and of the ability of international institutions, including the United Nations, to address the crisis with any degree of authority or dignity. Six, the US occupation of Iraq has led to the destruction and devastation of the Iraqi state and society. Law and order have broken down, resulting in a pervasive lack of human security. The physical infrastructure is in shambles. The healthcare delivery system is in poor condition. 
The education system has virtually ceased to function. There is massive environmental and ecological devastation and the cultural and archaeological heritage of the Iraqi people has been desecrated. Seven, the occupation has intentionally exacerbated ethnic, sectarian and religion, religious divisions in Iraqi society with the aim of undermining Iraq's identity and integrity as a nation. This is in keeping with the familiar imperial policy of divide and rule. Moreover, it has facilitated rising level of violence against women, increased gender oppression and reinforced forced patriarchy. Now, the previous points had all been addressed in previous um, testimonies that you heard the previous days. But according to this point seven, I would like to say something more about the so-called civil war because that has not, I think, been properly addressed. I will give you some evidence. Part of a secret $3 billion in new funds tucked away in the $87 billion Iraq appropriation that Congress approved in early November 2003 went towards the creation of a paramilitary unit manned by militiamen associated with former Iraqi exile groups. John Pike, an expert on classified military budgets at Global Security, uh, has stated, the big money would be for standing up an Iraqi secret police to liquidate the resistance. Three billion dollars. And it has to be loyal to the US. It's also pouring money into the creation of an Iraqi secret police staffed mainly by gunmen associated with members of the puppet Iraqi Governing Council. Those militiamen are linked to Ahmed Shalabi's INC, the Kurdish Peshmer Peshmerga forces and Shiite para paramilitary units, especially those of the Iran-backed Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq. Technically illegal, these armed forces have been tolerated, even encouraged by the Pentagon. End of quote. Colonel James Steele, who led the U.S. military advisory group in El Salvador from 1984 to 1986, was assigned to do the work with the newly appointed group of elite Iraqi counterinsurgency unit known as the Special Police Commandos. In El Salvador, Steele was responsible for developing special operation forces at brigade level during the height of the conflict in El Salvador. These forces, composed of the most brutal soldiers available, replicated the kind of small unit operations with which Steele was familiar with in Vietnam. In military circles, it was the use of such tactics that made the difference in ultimately defeating the guerrillas. For others, such as the Catholic priest Daniel Santiago, the presence of people like Steele contributed to another sort of difference. And I quote, people are not just killed by death squads in El Salvador. They are decapitated and then their heads are placed on pikes and used to dot the landscape. Men are not just disemboweled by the Salvadoran Treasury Police. They, their severed genitalia are stuffed into their mouths. Salvadoran women are not just raped by the National Guard. Their wombs are cut from their bodies and used to cover their faces. It is not enough to kill children. 
They are dragged over barbed wire until the flesh falls from their bones, while parents are forced to watch. So Negroponte was responsible in Iraq when these militias were created. And the people that were present in El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, to create a death squad that generated this sort of violence, were transferred to Iraq. So if you heard the stories about people whose heads are being drilled, if you hear the stories of, of people uh, and, and you just find the heads in the street, or people who have been cut in four pieces, That's all U.S. design. And the second point of this point seven that has not been mentioned was the violence against women. We all have seen the exhibition. Now, I am pretty confused. The image of giggling female soldiers pointing at the pines of naked hooded prisoners is no doubt a novelty. In our Western wars, women in uniform always had kept the most precious position. They were providing the fighting men with care, love, mercy and calmness or in, and in their white nursing uniforms, they were often described as an instance of sanity and humanity in the midst of a masculine, flesh-mincing machine. Not anymore, under the command of Mr. Donald Rumsfeld. Private Lindley England and her comrade specialist Sabrina Harmon are serving as angels of death. Women in the American army have a new role. They are providing the enemies of America with sexual humiliation. They are providing all of us with the ultimate pornographic image of war. No doubt, the American images of Abu Ghraib are a complete revelation. And yet, no one points out that we might be confronting an unprecedented new image. No one points out that it is a female soldier at its very center. No one dares say that the notion of femininity might have gone through a serious metamorphosis. We might confront here an, a newly devastating feminine role and yet hardly anyone stops to reflect about it loudly. It proves that America is going through a rapid process of moral and intellectual deterioration. <laughs> Presenting us with the fact that females, when protected with power, expose a complete, completely new form of sexual domination and abusive practice is rather alerting. It is clear, of course, that the war in Iraq is, is involved with more than one immoral aspect. Actually, it is pretty impossible to find anything moral about it. But this is something that has not been said yet, and it should be said. We cannot tolerate this moral deterioration where human life is worth less than nothing. I'm going back to point eight. The imposition of the UN sanctions in 1990 caused untold suffering and thousands of deaths. The situation has worsened after the occupation. This was written in 2005 and the figures should be adjusted. 
At least 100,000 civilians have been killed. It should read at least 655,000. 60,000 are being held in U.S. custody in inhumane conditions without charges. Thousands have disappeared and torture has become routine. Nine, the illegal privatization, deregulation and liberalization of the Iraqi economy by the occupation regime has caused the country into becoming a client economy that is controlled by the IMF and the World Bank, both of which are integral to the Washington Consensus. The occupying forces have also acquired control over Iraq's oil reserves. 11. There is widespread opposition to the occupation. Political, social and civil resistance through peaceful means is subjected to repression by the occupying forces. It is the occupation and its brutality that has provoked a strong armed resistance and certain acts of desperation. By the principles embodied in the UN Charter and in international law, the popular national resistance to the occupation is legitimate and justified. It deserves the support of people everywhere who care for freedom and justice. May I remind the Commission also that this text has been the work of the global peace movement and it has been approved by the global peace movement. So we think it is a valuable and legitimate document to look at and there are some legal texts in the second part. There's a, an international law appendix that maybe it could be useful uh, and serve the purposes uh, of uh, investigating if this text is um, good or not. Now, I will read very shortly the charges. On the basis of these preceding findings and recalling the Charter of the United Nations and other legal documents indicated in the appendix, the jury, the jury then, of the World Tribunal has established the following charges. A. Against the governments of the US and the UK. 1. Planning, preparing and waging the supreme crime of a war of aggression in contravention of the United Nations Charter and the Nuremberg Principles. 2. Targeting the civilian population of Iraq and civilian infrastructure by intentionally directing attacks upon civilians and hospitals, medical centers, residential neighborhoods, electricity stations, and water purification facilities. The complete destruction of the city of Fallujah in itself constitutes a glaring example of such crimes. Three, using disproportionate force and weapon systems with indiscriminate effects, such as cluster munitions, incendiary bombs, depleted uranium, and chemical weapons. Detailed evidence was presented uh, to this tribunal by expert witnesses and it is not part of this uh, conclusions. Four, using DU munitions in spite of all the warnings presented by scientists and war veterans to their devastating long-term effects on human beings and the environment. Five, failing to safeguard the lives of civilians during military activities and during the occupation period thereafter. Six, actively creating conditions under which the status of Iraqi women has seriously been degraded, contrary to the repeated claims of the leaders of the coalition forces. Women's freedom of movement has severely been limited, restricting their access to the public sphere, to education, livelihood, political and social engagement. Testimony was provided uh, then in, in 2005 that sexual violence and sex trafficking have increased since the occupation of Iraq began. Seven, using deadly violence against peaceful protesters, including the April 2003 killing of more than a dozen peaceful protesters in Fallujah. 
Eight, imposing punishments without charge or trial, including collective punishment on the people of Iraq. Repeated testimonies pointed to uh, snatch and grab operations, disappearances and assassinations. Nine, subjecting Iraqi soldiers and civilians to torture and cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment. And we all heard the testimony yesterday of Mr. Ali Shahal. Degrading treatment includes subjecting Iraqi soldiers and civilians to acts of racial, ethnic, religious and gender discrimination, as well as denying Iraqi soldiers prisoner of war status or requir as required by the Geneva Conventions. Abundant testimony was provided in Istanbul of unlawful arrests and detentions without due process or law. And of course, well known uh, is Abu Ghraib as well, uh, prisons in Mosul, Kambuka and uh, Basra. The employment of mercenaries and private contractors to carry out tortures has served to undermine accountability. Then, then rewriting the laws of a country that has been illegally invaded and occupied in violation of international covenants on the responsibilities of occupying powers in order to amass illegal profits and to control Iraq soil. Evidence was presented of a number of corporations that had profited from such transactions. 11. Willfully devastating the environment, con contaminating it by depleted uranium, combined with the plumes from burning oil wells, as well as huge oil spills and destroying agri agricultural lands, deliberately disrupting the water and waste removal systems in a, man in a manner verging on biological chemical warfare failing to prevent the looting and dispersal of radioactive material from nuclear sites. Extensive documentation is available on air and water pollution, land degradation and radioactive pollution. Failing to protect humanity's rich archaeological and cultural heritage in Iraq by allowing the looting of museums and established historical sites and positioning military bases in culturally and archaeologically sensitive locations. This took place despite prior warnings from UNESCO and Iraqi museum officials. Obstructing the right to information, including the censoring of Iraqi media, such as newspapers, for example, Al Hausa, Al Mashrik, and Al Mustakila, and radio stations, Baghdad Radio, the shutting down of the Baghdad offices of Al Jazeera television, targeting international and Iraqi journalists, imprisoning and killing academics, intellectuals and scientists. Fourteen, redefining torture in violation of international law to allow use of torture and illegal detentions, including holding more than 500 people at Guantanamo Bay without charging them or allowing them any access to legal protection and using extraordinary renditions to send people to be tortured in other countries known to commit human rights abuses and torture prisoners. Committing a crime against peace by violating the will of the global peace movement. I said that before already. Then engaging in policies to wage permanent war on sovereign nations. Syria and Iran have already been declared as potential targets. In declaring a global war on terror, the U.S. government has given itself the exclusive right to use aggressive military force against any targets of its choosing. Ethnic and religious hostilities are being fueled in different parts of the world. The U.S. occupation of Iraq has further emboldened the Israeli occupation in Palestine and increased the repression of the Palestinian people. The focus on state security and the escalation of militarization has caused a serious deterioration of human security and civil rights across the world. Against the Security Council of the United Nations, these were the charges. One, five minutes? Okay. One, failing to protect the Iraqi people against the crimes of aggression. 
Two, imposing hard, harsh economic sanctions on Iraq. Three, allowing the United States and the United Kingdom to carry out illegal bombing in the no-fly zones. Four, allowing the United States to dominate the United Nations. Five, failure to stop war crimes and crimes against humanity by the United States and its coalition partners in Iraq. Six, failure to hold the United States and its coalition partners accountable for violations of international law during the invasion and occupation. Then the charges against the government of the coalition of the willing, collaborating in the invasion and occupation of Iraq, thus sharing responsibility in the crimes committed. Then against the government of other countries, allowing the use of military bases and airspace and provider, providing other logistical support. Okay, I, I go on because there is a part here. Uh, the charges against the major corporate media, which I will uh, tell very shortly. One, disseminating the deliberate falsehoods spread by the governments of the US and the UK and failing to adequately investigate this misinformation, even in the face of abundant evidence to the contrary. Second, failing to report the atrocities being committed against Iraqi people by the occupying forces, neglecting the duty to give privilege and dignity to voices of suffering and marginalizing the global voices for peace and justice. Three, failing to report fairly on the ongoing occupation, silencing and discrediting dissenting voices, inciting an ideological climate of fear, racism, xenophobia and Islamophobia, which is then used to justify and legitimize violence perpetrated by the armies of the occupying regime, disseminating an ideology that glorifies masculinity and combat while normalizing war as a policy choice, complicity in the waging of an aggressive war and perpetuating a regime of occupation that is widely regarded as guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, enabling through the validation and dissemination of disinformation the fraudulent misappropriation of human and financial resources for an illegal war waged on false pretexts. And finally, promoting corporate military perspective on security, which are counterproductive to the fundamental concerns and priorities of the global populations and have seriously endangered civilian populations. I have to stop, uh, but I think, uh, honorary, honorary members of the Commission, that in this document that will be presented to you, you will find enough evidence to find the warmongers guilty. And this is only one case, Iraq.